Friends, on this fourth Sunday of Advent, we welcome you to worship here at Covenant Presbyterian Church. There is a lovely crowd here in person and a crowd joining us from coast to coast on the live stream. And I am joined by three lovely young ladies who have some very important announcements for us. So, Ms. Abby, would you begin? Welcome to Jesus' Table of Amazing Grace. Lovely. Miss Georgia. We're the baptized children of God. We are the baptized children of God. And Sophia. Let's give thanks to God for the gift of these children in our midst. This afternoon at 3 o'clock, we want to invite you back to the sanctuary for Covenant's first service of healing and wholeness. The holidays can be a wonderful time of the year, but the reality for many of us is that this can be a time of sadness and grief, and we want to honor that which is in your heart, so we invite you to come to lift up your hearts to God this afternoon at three and ask God to bring healing and wholeness. That will be here at three o'clock. Due to the intimacy of that service, we will not be live streaming, but we do pray that you'll join us for a time asking Jesus to heal our hearts. Ms. Shanna. Also, to let you know, there will be child care during that service. Just kids can come to the nursery area so that parents can enjoy that time of quiet. So good morning. It's hard to believe that coming up at the end of this week on Friday is Christmas Eve. Everyone says it kind of feels like it snuck up on us. But we are thrilled this year to be in person for three worship services. So at 5 p.m., we will have a family Christmas Eve service. It will be live streamed. It's just a fun, energetic time for families with young children. Grandparents love it, too, where we have readers tell the Christmas Eve story. And in between, we sing Christmas carols, and kids get to come decorate trees up front with their own ornaments that we give them when they arrive. So a great service. At 7 p.m., we'll have a traditional candlelight service with communion. And again, that will be live streamed if you choose to watch from home. Then at 9 p.m. this year, we're going to have just a beautiful, quiet, candlelight, contemplative service. That will not be live streamed, so you have to come here to Covenant to experience that one. Beginning in the new year, the first Tuesday of the month, the men are trying to keep up with the women in our lives. Every month, the women have a fellowship here at church, and the men are going to start a monthly meeting at 9 o'clock the first Tuesday in January. There will be limited refreshments, but really a time of fellowship followed by a short devotion to strengthen our spiritual lives. Each month this fall, or really since last spring, we have had a different mission focus that as a congregation we have had in front of us so that we can share our covenant love with our community, with members of our own church. And for this month in December, we shared that love with 23 Christmas families that the deacons adopted through our community school. And I just wanted to give you an update what a blessed thing we are part of. We want to thank all of you for your generous, generous contributions of gifts and finances. 23 families, which totaled 118 people, received gifts for their family. They received a delicious holiday meal that they will get to have. And the stories that the deacons have told, um, some of them are just heart-wrenching, but also so affirming. We had a family who lost the dad to COVID in the last couple of months. Three children, youngest was 12 months old. And that mom was so grateful 
story after story of how these families just were immensely grateful, said how blessed they were, and shared their faith in God for him providing and sending us as angels to help take care of them. In addition, on the 5th of December, some of you stayed after worship and took part in our fun card-making activity. Kids, you made a lot of those cards. Well, we had enough that every Christmas family received a card, as well as a lot of our shut-ins and homebound congregants were mailed cards. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for all of your support. Yeah, applause. So we find ourselves on the fourth Sunday of Advent, and we have another very special family who is going to come light our candles this morning. I'd like to invite Chad, Melinda, and Grant up to our Advent wreath. Tell the story of Jesus, the child of Bethlehem, who came to save us, and is coming again in glory. the prayer. Holy God, heaven and earth may pass away, but your realm is eternal and your promise is sure. Leaven our hearts with hope as our Redeemer draws near. Prepare our hearts for worship so that we may be ready to stand before Christ, our Judge and Savior, in whose powerful, glorious name we pray. Amen.
You may be seated. Did you catch the last line in the fifth verse? Asking the offspring of David to close the path of misery. And if you've looked at the news this week, it feels like we're on a path of misery. But as God's people, we know that the path has already been closed in Christ Jesus. Therefore, our spirits ought not be depressed, but pointing to Jesus, who is the author and hope of our salvation. In a spirit of humility, I invite you to pray the prayer of confession found on the screen behind me. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways according to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends, who is in a position to condemn you? Only Christ. And Christ lived for you, taught you the ways of the kingdom. Christ died for you. Christ overcame the powers of hell for you, and Christ rose again in victory to show all of the cosmos that if we would only put our trust in the author of life, we can be certain that our sins are washed away in the path to eternal and abundant life lie close at hand. who has been teaching us all about the love of Christ and that Jesus is good news. Can we all lift that up together? Jesus is good news. Our verse this time from John has a lot of words, didn't it, kids? So we learned hand motions to go with our verse this time, and we want to show them to you today. Do any of the kids want to come help me with the hand motions this morning? You don't have to, but if you want to come up, you can. Do you want to come up, Arlo and Anderson? Anyone else? Me? Me, Anderson? Okay, let's stand right here. Okay, do you want to stand right here, bud? There. Do you remember our first one? Can I refresh your heart? All right, are we ready, you guys? Let's stand and look out at all of our family of covenant people. Okay, so the words are, but these are written in your book that you may continue to believe. Very good. Then how do we say Jesus? That Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by Believe again, believing in him, you will have Rick Arm, life by the power of his holy name. Awesome job, guys. You did so good. Good job. Our song this morning, I know you're going to know it. 
go tell it on the mountain. Didn't all of us scream this like at the top of our lungs in a Christmas program when you were kids, right? So you may not know the motions, but we want you to stand up with us and sing it out. Parents and grandparents, I wanted to give you a reminder for next week. Can you believe next Sunday will be the day after Christmas? How does that happen? It will be the 26th, and I have the privilege next week of leading service and sharing a message. So we won't have kids' church, but families, it'll be a great time of family togetherness. We have some wonderful music that we'll have, so you are invited to come and have your kids be in church with you. All right. We ready? How do we go to kids' church? We march. We are marching in the light of God. 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 We are marching. We are marching, we are marching in the light of God. We are marching, we are marching, we are marching in the light of God.
Friends, I believe that one of the greatest gifts that we can receive and share with one another is the realization of the security that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest gift that we can receive or share is Jesus. Last week, the Starchers took an unexpected trip back to Ann Arbor, Michigan to celebrate the life of Chrissy's grandmother, and the love and support of this congregation has been wonderful. Perhaps the second best gift that one can receive is the gift of friendship of the Reverend Alex Chamberlain, who says, yes, I would be thrilled to preach for you three days out uh, from a Sunday. So, Alex, if you're watching online or if you're here in person, thank you. That's perhaps the second best gift you can give to someone. Friends, the third best gift you can give to an aspiring seminarian is to send them to Pittsburgh Seminary and not Princeton Seminary. What is this nonsense that Alex pulls? And here's why the third best gift is Pittsburgh and not Princeton. Today, Princeton is run by the best minds that have come from Pittsburgh. Craig Barnes, the president, Pittsburgh. Dale Allison, the most prestigious New Testament scholar in the United States, Pittsburgh. It'll be the last time Alex preaches here. No, just kidding. More seriously, the greatest gift that we can receive and give to someone is our Lord Jesus Christ. Today I want to focus on security. The prophet Micah talked about how the people would live secure. What does it mean for us to live secure in our faith? Because the politicians of the day talk about security, security at the border, or security from the other political party. Your financial advisors will talk about your financial security. And your pastor or your therapist will say, well, how secure are you in your identity? Friends, what does it mean to be secure, and I ask you the question, how secure are you? I want to tell you about a time where I felt pretty insecure in my own life. When I was a pastor in Elkins, West Virginia, and you do know that uh, the previous pastors when I was in West Virginia, Doug and Jan, worship with us online. So I'm curious to see if they type in on Facebook as they hear this story. There have been two times in my life where I have felt pretty insecure in my pastoral identity. One time was with a woman in West Virginia. Her name was Shirley. Shirley was at the church before I came. I don't know how old Shirley was because this world had been pretty hard on her. And with her aged, wrinkly skin and a mind that seemed to the outside observer to be outside of the bounds of appropriate mental health, there was Shirley every week. She would come early, not a classic Presbyterian. She would come early, about 45 minutes before worship started, and she would come to the front of the church, and she would kneel at the altar, and she would pray. About 10 minutes before service, we'd have to go get her and take her to her seat. But she wouldn't immediately go to her seat because she would go up, especially to the children in the congregation, and she would say, oh, dear child, I am so glad you are here. And she would try to kiss the child. And she was probably the most sincere person of faith that I encountered in Elkins, West Virginia. But because she lived a little differently than proper Presbyterians, 
because she smelled a little differently than proper Presbyterians. Everyone at the church was like, oh, we love Shirley, but we probably shouldn't put her at the greeting ministry, if you know what I mean, because her welcomeness in the midst of her physical poverty made lots of people feel uncomfortable, and it's this uncomfortability that I would like to share a little bit about. She said to the young pastor, oh, I would love to host you at my house. Please come. So I get her address from the directory and realize that it is in the biggest slum housing in Elkins, West Virginia. Previously, I had said to a social worker that I had worked with, I don't understand how this landlord gets away with this filth in this town. And in her wisdom, she said, Kevin, if so-and-so didn't provide a roof for these people, where else would they live? Gee, the world is complicated for me sometimes. So I go over to the slum housing, and I knock on the door, and there is Shirley. Pastor, I am so grateful that you are here. And the door opens, and there is hordes of what I think is trash, piled to my waist in some portions, piled up to the ceiling, and there are paths that go through her apartment. She points me to a pretty decrepit chair. Pastor, can I get you a cup of tea? Now, amidst the overwhelming stench in the apartment of rotting trash and cat urine and cat feces that I had stepped over, I really wasn't comfortable taking her hospitality of tea, but what else was a pastor to do? So I said, yes, surely. And she goes off to the kitchen, and I'm sitting there to myself thinking, Kevin can deal with a lot of things in life, but I am pretty comfortable at this moment. The apartment is cold. I would say about 58 degrees. My guess is that Shirley had lived, learned to live with that temperature. And as she brought back this tea that I don't remember that it tasted any good, I remember the Spirit speaking to me in my heart saying that in your insecurity, Kevin, you are experiencing the hospitality of your maker. You see, as the world looked upon Shirley with interesting eyes, Shirley wasn't worried about her material well-being. Shirley wasn't worried about the latest politics of the day, surely most simply loved Jesus. And perhaps she is the most secure person I have ever met. How secure are you? On this fourth Sunday of Advent, we come to the scripture where Mary is pregnant and she goes to her cousin Elizabeth. And we talk about the insecurities of the world and the insecurities of our hearts, right? Mary was in a place to be insecure. Her people lived occupied by a foreign government. No one liked the Romans. There were rumors of uprising and revolt. Politic, political insecurity. Let's talk about financial insecurity as well. Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but Joseph learned that somehow Mary got impregnated by someone else. So any good Jewish citizen would say goodbye to the fiancé for infidelity, right? It's dishonorable to commit adultery. 
So if this were to happen, Mary becomes not only socially insecure, but literally financially, her material well-being is wrapped up in the insecurity of her miraculous pregnancy. And let's just talk about insecurities for what they are. It's only in the past 70 to 100-ish years that the miracle of childbirth has become relatively safe. I don't know what the percentages of surviving childbirth were 2,000 years ago, but my guess, the survivability of childbirth was anywhere between 50 and 75%. Many women died in childbirth. So amidst all these insecurities, we come to this episode in Scripture. It comes to us from Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 56. Sisters and brothers, listen to the word of the Lord. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to see me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Let me read that one more time. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked with favor on the lowliness of his servant. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me, and holy is his name. God's mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm, and he has scattered the proud and the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the powerful from their thrones, and he has lifted up the lowly, and he has filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy. According to the promise he made to our ancestors, to Abraham, and to his descendants forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and then returned to her home. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I like to dig into the scripture so that God's word can speak to us through the Bible. Perhaps you've heard this fancy Latin word called the Magnificat. Before. We just read Mary's Magnificat. My soul magnifies the Lord. And this beautiful song that Mary sings in her poetic eloquence. She declares the goodness of God in her life, God's security in the midst of all of her insecurities. And Mary magnifies. The Lord. When was the last time you magnified the Lord? Friends, this is the Magnificat. For those of us who have friends or family members in the Roman Catholic Church, it's from this scripture that our Catholic friends get the Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou. And blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. That comes straight from Luke chapter 1, verse 42. The Hail Mary. 
You see, our Catholic friends are not necessarily all that different, because sometimes we wonder, what is it with their obsession with Mary? I don't know. I'm not necessarily Catholic, but I can tell you this, that the Catholics in our community take seriously that Mary is the mother of God. And as they think about all the saints, how saintly is it for all the mothers in your life who raised you, how saintly is it for Mary to be the mother of not just a special child, but to be God himself. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. So in this magnification of God's grace in her life amidst all of her insecurities, today Christians all around the world on this Sunday will declare the magnification that Mary gives to us. Cast down the mighty, fill the hungry, lift up the lonely, and send the rich away. This is how she magnifies the Lord, remembering God's promises to her people and what God will do. But it's interesting to me. That if the God of the universe shows his power to do all of these things, you see how Mary is standing on a snake, the symbol of evil, uh, and a skull, the symbol of death. Our Lord does these things. We are called to do these things. But how does our Lord Jesus accomplish this? We find that our God does not sell his soul to fill the Supreme Court with those who Jesus thinks would be the best. No. We find that our God does not do backroom political dealings to come out to be in the room where it happens. No. Our Lord Jesus, the God of the universe, does not come through the actions of Caesar. But your God, my God, fulfills all of these things by coming into the world as a helpless child who cries for the nourishment of his mother, a mother who is a teenage peasant living in an occupied land. And in a few years, they will flee as migrants, my friends, escaping political oppression from Herod, and they go to Egypt merely so that Jesus can live. This is how our God works. My colleague Ben Kramer in town, who works at the Cathedral of the Rockies, says this about the power of God who fulfills these things. He says, it is quite the fragile God who needs political power to preserve and enforce their will. But it is quite the powerful God who partners with the peasants, is born in poverty, washes feet, heals the sick, advocates for the oppressed, is unjustly killed, and still changes the world. This, my friend, is the God who has done all of these things. Has done. You see, so many of my friends say, this is the mission that Mary gives to God's people. And I think this is true. But I want to look closely at the scripture that Mary gives to us. Mary uses the perfect past tense to describe what God has already done. He has shown strength. He has scattered the proud. He has brought down the powerful. He has filled the hungry and sent the rich away. He has helped his servant Israel. And if you're a good Presbyterian critical thinker, I hope you're thinking, really, he has? <laughs> because so often it doesn't feel that way. And in the midst of our own insecurities, we waver in our faith. Oh, Omicron's going to make another resurgence 
of the virus. Woe is us. Oh, the other political party, how terrible they are. Woe is us. What will we do? Why are there still all of these hungry people in the world? And I wonder if we serve a God who says, Why is it that you still live in a world filled with hungry people? All of you rich Presbyterians here in Boise, you have the opportunity to do something about it. And for those who are secure in their faith, just like Shirley, who had no means of her own, she knew that God had already done these things and could live securely in her faith. I want to point out one final thing from the scripture because I think that it's pretty interesting as we step back from Mary's Magnificat. If you have your Bible with you, it's possible that you have a footnote when Mary starts to speak. There is some ambiguity in the earliest fragments of Scripture about who said the Magnificat. Mostly today, we believe that this is Mary's speech. But did you know that there are some early textual fragments that indicate that it was Elizabeth who was continuing her speech as she greeted Mary? Was it... Mary, who uttered the Magnificat? Was it Elizabeth? And this is where I love the beauty of biblical scholarship. Because when our soul magnifies the Lord and remembers the promises that God has uh, shared with us, does it really matter who said these words? Was it Mary? Was it Elizabeth? I dare say, perhaps it should be you who utter these words from Scripture and who magnifies the Lord and what God has done and what God will do. Do you have the faith to utter these words of the Magnificat? These words point us back to the Scripture that Ron read for us. In Micah, I'll read them again. Hundreds of years before Jesus, the prophet declares what God is doing. And he shall stand and feed his flock in the strength of the Lord, and they shall live secure. For now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be the one of peace. My friend Shirley, who taught me so much about security, we believe that she had some mental illness. In our small mountain town, there was an annual parade, and the good Baptists in town wanted to make sure Jesus walked through carrying his cross, so Pastor Bill dressed up in a robe and put on a pretty comfortable crown of thorns. They made a wooden cross with wheels behind it so he could actually drag it through the parade, right? And you know my friend Shirley, who loved Jesus? She thought it was Jesus. And do you know what she did? Our church had a front row uh, seat to the parade. Shirley watched from our church. And she slowly stepped down the steps. And she said, Jesus, my Lord, my God. And she ran up to Pastor Bill and got down on her knees and said, I love you. And Pastor Bill embraced her and loved her. Do you remember when I went to her apartment? She told me a story I'll never forget. She said, Kevin, when I was young, my father took me to the ocean. And I was scared. Scared of the waves, scared of the abyss. But my father, he picked me up and held me in his arms. And when I knew that I could cling to my father, and my father would cling to me that I could enjoy the beautiful mystery that was the ocean. And I need not be afraid because my father would protect me. And she said, Pastor, that's the way it is with our God. Friends, I pray that in all the insecurities of your own life, 
that you would cling to the Father and trust that he will be with you to the end of the age. Friends, the greatest gift you can give or receive is the realization that you are secure in our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, you hold us. Help us to cling to you so that we may survive the waves of our life and all the riptides that threaten us. Help us to cling. Help us to know your love. Help us to know that you have already overcome the world if we would just cling to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen.
may be seated. Friends, one of the ways we begin to experience the security and peace of God is realizing it's not about us and we give this stuff away. And the offering is one of those places we can put into practice of giving God's love away. In your bulletin, there is an insert uh, about the Presbyterian Church USA Christmas Joy Offering. If you would like in your donation, you can mark a memo that says uh, PCUSA Christmas Joy Offering, and that donation will go to the denomination, and we'll take 100% of that, and we'll divide it up. 50% of those offerings will go to pastors who are experiencing financial need. The other 50% will support education uh, amongst our 60 Presbyterian-related colleges across the country, of which the College of Idaho is one of those. So if the Lord is nudging you to support to that, just mark PCUSA Christmas Joy on your offering. Also, the Stewardship Committee this time of year, uh, our practice here at Covenant is to give Christmas bonuses from not from the budget, but from a special offering. So if you would like to contribute to Christmas bonuses to the staff, uh, you can mark staff bonus in your offering as well. Lots of ways to give this time of year. And because Gwen called me out a few weeks ago saying uh, that Kevin doesn't ask for your money, God doesn't ask, money makes the church happen, right? But do you know what God is more interested in? Your hearts. So during this opportunity of offering, let's consider our financial gifts. Let's consider how we will lift up the entirety of our hearts to the Lord as we go to make the way.
to be seated. We come to our time of prayer. Paul tells us to grieve with those who grieve, to celebrate with those who celebrate. So we grieve and are reminded of the hope of the resurrection uh, for Chrissy's family, the entire Hesslers, as they remember Grandma Ruth. We grieve and are reminded of the hope of the resurrection for our friend Kay Grant. Her sister Heidi in Wyoming had to say goodbye to her husband, Kay's brother-in-law, uh, just late this past week. So Kay, we pray with you and we remember the hope that we have in Jesus. Our favorite non-turned-Presbyterian Barbara Poltz just hasn't been feeling well, and we miss her up here. So please keep Barbara in your prayers. We've been praying for Bim's brother, Paul, who is not progressing as much as doctors would hope as he recovers from a stroke and a pretty catastrophic fall with significant head injury. So we pray. Our friend Dale Elb, who underwent brain surgery to remove brain cancer, uh, texted me photos of his smiling face late this week and said, Kevin, hallelujah, I'm doing great. I'm halfway through the regiment. The doctors say I'm doing better than most they have seen. And then he said, I've never felt closer to Jesus in my life. Please share this message with my church. Dale Elb, brain cancer, the holidays, knows the security of clinging to his Lord. So we celebrate that with Dale. We celebrate with those who celebrate. We celebrate the marriage of Billy and Ron yesterday. So we are grateful for what God is doing in your life. And we come in this season of the news, right, where people are thinking about Omicron. I'm no epidemiolo epidemiologist, but let me say this to my people. Talk to your doctor about how you can best live your life and protect yourself from a disease. Please do that. And people are saying that we will likely see a rise in cases, even here in Idaho. I don't know whether that's true or not, but I want to reiterate what we've said all along here at Covenant. We trust you to make decisions that are best for you. We're going to be live streaming until Jesus comes walking down Randolph Avenue and Elkins. Um, so if you need to worship from home for the next month or two, God bless you. We plan to be here in masks um, as long as the Lord allows. So just as your pastor, um, please talk to your physician about doing what's best for you. And with that said, let's pray. Lord Jesus, Help us to remember that our security is not in politicians. It's not in the health of our bank account. Remind us that our only hope in life and in death is that we belong to you. So, Lord, we believe that you have wrapped your arms around us. Help us simply to respond by wrapping our arms around our Heavenly Father that we may enjoy the beauty of the ocean and that we would live not fearful, but securely in your arms, knowing the peace and beauty that comes with you. Lord, to be with all of those who are grieving during this season, Help us to celebrate well the arrival of your entrance into the mundane lives of your people to give us hope. May this be our life and our message this Christmas season. Pray all this in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Friends, Jesus has come, so let us boldly stand and sing our praise with our closing hymn, Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Friends, the angels sing it. I pray that you will sing it this week as well. For the greatest gift that you can receive or share is that of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, who promises to deliver us and take us to our home. So go. We'll have a service here at 3 this afternoon and Christmas Eve services on Friday. And as you go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>